Good morning, everyone. Um, before we begin, can someone open us with a word of prayer, please? Check. Check. Okay. Yeah. Father, thank you and thank you this day, Mr. Father, for our suffering and hands. Thank you this new day. For our suffering, everyone, Lord, you guide us, give us, help us to understand, give your wisdom and knowledge. I suffer in your hands, this subject, Lord, we get we get words. We will be able to understand what I something especially is the man. Lord, you talk with us through your word of God and speak with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Can we raise the volume of my kids? Okay. Okay, so uh, today is our last class. So um, we have the whole book of Revelation to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just do a quick uh, overview of the background and then uh, go into an outline of the book itself. Okay, so um, we uh, know that the author of Revelation was John. Uh, who has written a few other books. What are the other books in the New Testament? Gospel of John, yeah. Yeah, first, second, and third John. So John wrote quite a few books in uh, the New Testament. Um, we... Uh, also know who he's written this letter to, if we can just read Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Um, it'll give us an idea of, it'll give us a brief introduction. So let's just read these first three verses that are given here, 1.1, 1, 1.4, 1, 1, and 1.9. 1, Someone can read that for us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace for, from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Verse 9, I, John, both your brother and uh, companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. So uh, this is the only book where John has actually clearly said that he is the writer of the book. Uh, in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, uh, we don't have that. And then in the Gospel of John, uh, also, we don't have a clear indication that he is the author, but here clearly we can see mentioned in several verses, he uh, refers to himself as the one who has written this book. Uh, so he was a disciple and apostle, and then he was an elder in the church. Uh, and we, from the verses we read, we know that he wrote to the seven churches in Asia. And uh, he wrote from the island of Patmos. So uh, we'll just go in here. So Patmos was an island that was um, not very far away from Ephesus. And this is where he was put in exile. Uh, the island was actually not... So when we think of exile, we think that the island would be a completely deserted island just for criminals. But it was uh, it actually had a gymnasium. It had a temple for the goddess Artemis. So there were people who would come to worship the temple there. So it wasn't the typical kind of uh, place we would imagine for a prisoner. Uh, in that way, John had received some favor in being exiled to this 
island okay so uh, it was written around ad 95 to 96 um, and this is during the reign of domitian who was the roman emperor and he was known for persecuting uh, the christians so he uh, from the government perspective or from uh, that leadership perspective uh, had not shown favor towards the Christians. And so we see that continue among uh, in Rome itself that there was a lot of persecution uh, against Christians. Uh, so these are the seven churches that are given here. This is the verse uh, that we read. And uh, if we read that in uh, Revelation, we see that Jesus is among the churches. So uh, if you look at it geographically also, it looks like they're all in a kind of circle. Uh, so almost like uh, that's a picture of how Jesus was in the midst of all of these churches. So this is all in Asia Minor. Uh, the genre of revelation is so uh, it has it's linked back to Old Testament prophecy. Uh, it's apocalyptic in that it's talking about the end times, about Christ's return. And chapters two to three are kind of like prophetic letters. Uh, we see that even in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 29, uh, where there is, he's writing against the sins of God's people. And he's writing a letter to the people. So chapters 2 and 3 follow that kind of style of writing. Um, the purpose to give believers a renewed vision of uh, the risen Christ, to call for repentance and renewal within the church, and to reveal God's plans for his church in the future. OK, so we'll see why the, this is the purpose for Revelation. Um, we see that there was a lot of uh, persecution among Christians. Uh, and the emperor of the time, Domitian, was uh, hated by most people because of his cruelty towards um, people from lots of different religious backgrounds. OK, so it was not only Christians and Jews that he was uh, persecuting. It was people from other religious backgrounds as well. So during his lifetime, he had demanded that people start worshipping him. Um, this was usually done for some emperor who had died. So after they die, then there would be a worship. The worship of the emperor would begin. But Domitian was one of the emperors who, during his lifetime, wanted people to begin worshipping him. And so if people didn't worship him, they were persecuted. So Jews, like Christians, would not have been willing to worship him. And so they also were persecuted. But Christians, in addition to being uh, persecuted by the Rome, uh, that uh, that cult of worshipping the emperor uh, were also being persecuted by Jews who didn't want to associate with Christians because they thought that Christians would bring further persecution on the Jews. And so uh, there was persecution from the Jews, persecution from the Roman uh, authorities and Rome in general, people's uh, persecution uh, from their neighbors. So it is in this context that John is writing to encourage. So while we talk about uh, Revelation as a book that is written uh, about the future, it's also written to the church at that time to encourage them in the face of persecution. So it's talking about the judgment that God is going to bring on the leaders, on the rulers, uh, of Babylon, right? And Babylon uh, refers at that time also could refer to Rome because Rome was the uh, was representative of Babylon to the church at that time. So we look at it as both a book written to the churches of the time, but also a book written about what God was going to do in the end times. It's both and, OK? Um, so uh, one last point from here. Um, for those who were, so there was the persecution side of things, but there was also the temptation within the church to start 
adopting a lot of the culture around them just so that they wouldn't be persecuted. And so uh, when, Paul, uh, when John is addressing these seven churches, he's addressing sins within the church, he's addressing persecution, and he's addressing this temptation to, uh, to start to follow the culture around the church so that they will not be persecuted. Uh, so some unique features, uh, we know that Revelation focuses on the second coming of Christ. We see that both at the start and end of the book, uh, Jesus is right at the center of everything that happens in Revelation. Uh, we see Jesus mentioned from the opening of the scroll that starts to bring the judgment on the earth before Christ comes, uh, right up to the end where Christ is worshipped. Uh, with the father who is on the throne. Okay, uh, it has a lot of Old Testament references. So if you're doing a study on Revelation, like we talked about in interpreting scripture, you'll have to do a lot of going back to the Old Testament, reading passages in the Old Testament to understand what they are talking about in the book of Revelation. Uh, we also see the use of a lot of symbolic numbers, uh, a lot of numbers in general. Uh, some of the common ones are 4, 7, 12, 24. Uh, 7 is definitely one of the most common numbers. Uh, and then it pronounces seven blessings. Uh, one on all who listen to and obey what the book says, what the scroll says. Uh, blessings on those who die in the Lord, blessings on all those who are watching for Christ's return, uh, blessings on those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb, blessings on those who share in the first resurrection, blessings on those who obey the prophecy written in the scroll, and blessings on those who wash their robes uh, so that they can eat from the tree of life. Um, so Revelation and Daniel are very, very close, uh, closely tied together. And you'll do a study on the, uh, these two books in your second and third years, if you uh, are continuing. Um, so Daniel, uh, if we look, let's just read from Daniel uh, 8, 26. And then Daniel 12, 8 to 9, if someone can read that for us. Daniel 8, 26, and 12, 8 to 9. Daniel 8, 26, and the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And uh, Daniel 12, 8 to 9. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Thank you. So we see here in Daniel uh, these two references where uh, the vision that's given to Daniel, he's told to seal up. That means don't reveal uh, what you have seen because it's not yet the time for it to be revealed. Uh, if we can read Revelation 22.10, someone can read that for us. Revelation 22.10. Revelation uh, 22.10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of the, this book, for the time is at hand. Okay. So we see the difference between Daniel and Revelation. Daniel is saying, seal up the vision because it contains something that is about the distant future. And Revelation 22.10 is saying, don't seal the words of this prophecy because the time is near. 
So uh, where Daniel was told to hide the revelation, uh, revelation uh, John is told to uh, to share the revelation that he has received. Okay, so that's the difference between Daniel and Revelation. Um, Second Thessalonians two talks about the Antichrist's rise and fall, and Revelation gives more details of this. Uh, Second Peter three talk about the end of the earth and the beginning of the heavens. Uh, so Second Peter three gives details on the end of the earth, uh, but doesn't talk so much about the new heavens and the new earth. Whereas Revelation uh, focuses on the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, so with that, we'll go into the actual book and the content of uh, Revelation itself. Uh, Revelation 119 is a good verse uh, just to give us an introduction to what is going to happen in the book. Uh, if someone can just read that for us, Revelation 119. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this okay so it's talking about things you've seen things which are happening now and things that are going to happen so the past the present and the future revelation 1 uh, focuses more on what dan uh, what john has actually seen revelation 2 and 3 is what is happening in the church at present and then revelation 4 to 22 is what is going to happen in the future um so that's just how the book is broken up uh beginning with chapter one we'll go through an outline there's quite a lot of slides uh, because it's a long book uh, so we'll start with chapter one so chapter one begins with the introduction to the book i think um we read these two verses, right? Revelation verses 1, 1 and 2. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this is the introduction to the book, saying this is a revelation that Jesus himself gave through an angel to John, and John has written down whatever he saw regarding the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then it goes on into the rest of the book to say what all this was, what all he saw. Um, then verses 9 to 20 is where John actually begins to have this vision uh, that he records. Um, let's just read verses 11 and verses 17, the second part of verse 17 to 18 of chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, 11. Saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Samarana, to Pergamos, to Thyatira and Sardis, to Philadelphia and to uh, Laodicea. And 17, the second part of 17 to uh, verse 18. Seven. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forever more. Okay, and I hold the death of uh, the keys of death and Hades. So we see here that uh, right at the start, he sees Jesus and he receives this instruction to write a letter, letter to the seven churches or write a scroll that will go to the seven churches that are mentioned in Asia. Uh, so the next two chapters have these seven letters uh, that he's written or a single letter with addressing the seven churches. Uh, these seven churches would be in today's modern Turkey. Uh, and each of the letters has something where he is talking about what the church is doing well, 
that is what are their strengths then he talks about where there is correction needed so talks about uh, things in the church that they need to change things that are not pleasing to the lord and then he calls them to repentance uh, each time there's a warning and there's a reward so if you don't repent this is what will happen if you do repent this will be your reward uh, the only church that doesn't have any correction is the church of philadelphia in chapter 3 verses 7 to 13 uh, so that we, with that we've completed what was what is that is what was taking place at the time and now we move into what was going to happen uh let's just read chapter 4 verses 1 if you can read that for us please revelation chapter 4 okay verse 1 after this thing i looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which i heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying come up here and i will show you things which must take place after this thank you so here we see that shift to the future what is going to happen uh so from chapter 4 to 22 is the future revelation that god is giving uh john uh in this place uh, we see uh, a description of god the father on the throne so basically this is where john is taken into the throne room in heaven and we see god the father on the throne we see the 24 elders we see uh, the seven lamps the spirit of god and we see the four living creatures before the throne all of this is described in chapter 4 um and then we see the description of uh, jesus himself who's the lion of judah and the root of david um let's just read chapter 5 verses 2 to 5 so 4 and 5 is where it's focusing on what's happening in the throne room itself then i saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it so i wept much because no one was found worthy to open and to read the scroll or to look at it but one of the elders said to me do not weep behold the lamb of the tribe of juda the root of david has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose its seven seals okay so uh, after we see the worship before the throne the next part is where the scroll is brought and it's sealed up uh, and no one is found worthy to open the scroll except jesus so jesus comes in and uh, he is the one who's open to open the scroll so that god's judgment on the earth can be poured out before christ returns uh, with that we come into the opening of the uh of the judgment uh verses so the chapters that talk about how god will judge the earth or how uh there will be um a judgment of the wicked judgment of all the sin that has taken place on the earth uh it begins with the seven seals uh the lamb opens six seals and each of them uh have an event that happens one after the other with each seal um then in chapter 7 we have 144000 of the saints spe specifically from israel being sealed for god uh we have the seventh seal opened in chapter 8 and then we have the seven trumpets uh which we will look at after this so the seven seals um we have the rise of the antichrist which is the first seal the second seal is war the third seal is famine uh the fourth seal is death and hell uh the fifth seal is the martyrs in heaven um the sixth seal is the wrath of god and then the seventh seal is silence in heaven okay um so between the sixth seal and the seventh seal we have chapter 7 which comes in that talks about those 144000 who are uh, sealed with god's uh, stamp 
Then we have the seven trumpets in chapter 8. Uh, so the first trumpet is hail, fire, and blood. And if you look at these, they are very close to the plagues that we see in the Old Testament, which uh, was sent on the Egyptians through Moses. So you see a lot of similarity between these and the plagues. Uh, so there's hail, fire, and blood. The sea turned to blood. Waters poisoned. Planets darkened. The first woe, which is uh, losing of demons to torment people, that's the fifth trumpet. Um, the sixth trumpet is uh, losing of 200 million um, to kill one third of the population. So it talks about locusts, uh, they're possibly demons. And then the seventh trumpet is the proclamation of Christ's triumph. So do you remember in the Old Testament what trumpets were used for? How were trumpets used in the Old Testament? For victory. To declare victory, OK. So usually, uh, trumpets were used in battle, and they were also used in the temple. These are two places we see uh, trumpets used. Uh, one where it's used to call people to battle, so to alert the people to get ready to enter into battle against the enemy. So that was one use of the trumpet. Uh, the second use of the trumpet uh, we see is in worship itself. So if we read uh, in the Old Testament, uh, there are records of temple worship where there were trumpeters. The priests were playing the trumpet while there was worship happening. Uh, and in a few places, in Joshua 6.6, 6, we know that there were seven trumpets used. In First Chronicles 15.4, in Nehemiah 12.41, there are records of seven trumpets being used specifically. Uh, so like that, uh, this is almost like a call to battle uh, because God is going to battle against the rulers of the earth uh, who have um, who have actually tormented his people, who have uh, killed a lot of the believers, and so God is coming to judge the uh, judge the earth on the behalf of his followers. Um, Okay, so uh, we'll just read chapter 9, verses 20 to 21, and then go into chapter 10. Someone can read chapter 9, 20 to 21. So this is after the seven trumpets. So seven seals, seven trumpets. And then we read this in chapter 9, verses 20 to 21. Chapter 9, verse 20 to 21. But the rest of the mind can, who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold silver brass stone and wood which can neither see nor hear or walk verse 21 and they did not repent of their murders or their scoreries or their sexual immorality or their sites. OK, thank you. So uh, the sad thing here is uh, God has sent so much judgment on the earth, but their people are still not uh, turning to God. They still don't repent. They continue to worship idols. They continue to practice the sin that they, uh, they were doing, which is why God has brought judgment on them. Uh, that continues to be practiced in the uh, in the world in and among the nations. Uh, so from here we see what God continues to do. Um, in chapter ten, we see an uh, angel descend, uh, where some revelation that comes at that time is to be sealed. So he tells uh, John do not reveal these words that you have heard. So there's still some revelation that is not fully given to us in this book, uh, because there was something that was still kept sealed. Um, 
and then after that another scroll is given to john which he is asked to eat and then he starts to pronounce more judgment on the earth after this uh, chapter 11 is where we have the two witnesses come in uh, now these two witnesses um, could either be elijah and moses or Elijah and Enoch. Um, we know that Elijah and Enoch, according to scripture, both of them didn't die. Uh, they, their bodies just went up to heaven. Uh, so it's possible that these are the two witnesses who come uh, down and then here, this is where they die. Um, or it could be Elijah and Moses because the miracles that are described here are very much like the miracles that are done by Elijah and Moses in the Old Testament. Okay, so uh, these two witnesses come and they have a lot of power. They, do, uh, they are taking the gospel to different parts of the world. Uh, and um, But at some point, the Antichrist kills them. Their bodies are uh, lying on the streets in Jerusalem. And about three and a half days after they are dead on the streets, their bodies come back to life and they rise to heaven. Uh, so their witness goes out into all the earth. Like the whole world sees both their death and their resurrection. Uh, and th with this is when the seventh trumpet is sounded. Uh, so can someone read chapter 11 verses 15 for us? Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of your Lord on, of his Christ, and he shall regain forever and ever. Okay, so the seventh trumpet is announcing that uh, Christ is Christ's return is imminent, that his kingdom is going to be established at this time. Uh, with that, we go back again. So although that seventh trumpet is sounded, chapter 12 again goes back to another vision of the woman, child, and dragon. This is something we've discussed in our other class, Interpreting Scripture, uh, where the woman represents Israel, the child represents Jesus, and the dragon is Satan. Uh, so it talks about how Satan tries to... Uh, uh, tries to kill Jesus, but Jesus is taken up to the throne of God uh, and he's kept there, uh, but that he will come back. Um, then we see in chapter 13, the beast and the false prophet. So this is pointing to the Antichrist. Uh, what chapter 13 tells us is that the Antichrist was wounded um, with a wound that should have killed him but somehow he was healed and he's still alive. And so the whole world is uh, in awe of this uh, beast who is able to live even though he uh, was wounded mortally. And then it also talks about a false prophet who will start to call people to worship the Antichrist. So he is starting to uh, make people worship the Antichrist. And then we read about the number 666 being put on people uh, so that they can buy and sell. So everyone needs to have that identification so that they can engage in trade. Uh, we go into chapter 14. Uh, here it goes back to the 144,000 who've been sealed. So, this is to contrast the uh, people who have been sealed with the number 666 versus the 144,000 who've been sealed with the stamp of God on them. And uh, these people are singing a new song to God. Um, it's during this time that there are three angels who are sent out. One angel to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. Another angel to tell everyone that Babylon is falling. So turn away from, uh, do not be part of what Babylon is doing. And then the third is warning against worship and receiving the mark of the beast. So these three angels go out. Um, and then is... Uh, in chapter 14, the end of the chapter 14 is where Christ comes to take back all those who believe in him 
and to pour out uh, another judgment is sent on the earth to pour out God's wrath on the people of the earth. Uh, we then come to chapter 15 and 16, which is the last set. So the third set of seven judgments. So we read the first one was the seven seals. Uh, the second one was the seven trumpets. And this one is the seven bowls of uh, judgment that are poured out. Um, so let's just read chapter 15. Uh, OK, I don't think this is a specific verse. But uh, all those who have victory over the beast, over his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, uh, are singing a song to the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Uh, at the same time, these seven bowls of wrath, which are seven plagues, are prepared to pour out on the rest of the earth. Um, so again, quite similar to the plagues in the Old Testament against Egypt, we see loathsome sores. The sea turns to blood, rivers and springs turn to blood, um, men scorched with intense heat, darkness and pain uh, on the Antichrist's kingdom. Uh, the U river Euphrates dries up. This is in preparation for the Battle of Armageddon. And then we see the great earthquake and hailstones as uh, the cities fall apart, and specifically in Jerusalem, where the city is divided. Um, so we come to chapter 17. Uh, this is where we see the great prostitute sitting on a beast. Uh, so this talks about a religion that is influencing a lot of the nations and the peoples. Uh, but at some point, the Antichrist uh, and the rulers with him, which are 10 rulers with, uh, which are with him, turn against this religion. So they turn against that false prophet. Uh, then in chapter 18, there's a sudden collapse of Babylon itself. So that whole uh, economic system collapses. And all those who have become rich through the economic system uh, see the destruction of Babylon. And they are mourning over its uh, destruction. So the chapter 17 is the destruction of the religious system. Chapter 18 is the destruction of the uh, economic system. And then in chapter 19 is the Armageddon itself. If we can read chapter 19, verses 1 to 2. Someone can read that for us. Chapter 19, verse 1 to 2. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged a great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on earth the blood of his servants shed by her. OK, so uh, this is a response to the destruction of uh, that 17 and 18 talk about of Babylon. Uh, in 19, uh, those in heaven are celebrating that God's judgment has come down on Babylon that has caused so much uh, corruption in the world. So when it's saying the great prostitute, uh, we know from the Old Testament that that was uh, usually used for Israel or any nation that had turned away from God. Right. So it is more of in worship, they had abandoned uh, God and gone after other gods. So Babylon had had that kind of influence, had turned away. So it was a religious system that turned people's away, uh, people away from God. And at the same time, it also had resulted in the death of many followers of Christ. Uh, if we read, who corrupted the earth by her adulteries, that is turning people away from God. And he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So uh, they had killed a lot of God's people. And so uh, this is God's judgment against uh, Babylon, against the Antichrist and all those who have um, followed the Antichrist. Uh, we'll also read uh, chapter 19, verses 7 to 9, if someone can read that for us. Revelation 19, 7 to 9. 
Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife was made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true saying of God. Thank you. So if you see here, this is uh, the bride is contrasted with the prostitute. Okay, whereas the prostitute has turned away from God, uh, we see the prostitute described as wearing a lot of um, uh, jewelry, a lot of very rich, fancy clothing. Uh, the bride is dressed in fine linen, and linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. So uh, basically, these people have walked in purity, they are dressed by God himself, uh, and what they are wearing is clean and bright. Uh, so contrast with the prostitute. Um, so the last three chapters of Revelation, uh, we see Satan's imprisonment, the beginning of chapter 20. Uh, we see the millennial reign of Christ with his saints, uh, Satan's final rebellion and judgment. Uh, then we see um, that all those who were with Satan are cast alive into hell, known as the uh, lake of fire. So in chapter 20, we have the whole description of the millennial reign of Christ. So Satan is locked up. Christ reigns with his saints for a thousand years. But during this, during this time, even though Christ is reigning, at the end of the time when uh, Satan comes back, he's still able to deceive people, which is a very sad thing. After a thousand years of having experienced Christ's reign, uh, people still are deceived by Satan when he comes back. And this is where uh, final judgment is given on the earth over Satan and all those who join with him uh, to come against Christ, to fight against Christ. And then um, chapter 21, we have the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, we'll read that, uh, chapter 21, verses 1 to 8, and chapter 22, verses 1 to 4. Chapter 21, verses 1 to 8, and 22, 1 to 4. Chapter 21, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with, the, with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abomination, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Thank you. In chapter 22, verses 1 to 4. Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 to 4, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and, and of the Lamb. Verse 2, in the middle of its street, and one 
on one either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits each tree wielding its fruit every month the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations verse 3 and there shall be no more cruise but the throne of the throne of god and the lamb of and the lamb shall be in it and his servant shall serve him verse 4 they shall see his face and his name shall be on their forehead Okay, so this is the close of Revelation, where uh, we're given this closing picture of what the new heavens and the new earth is going to look like. Uh, it's a beautiful end to uh, what we see in the preceding chapters of judgment, of death, of plague, disease, war, sin, all of those things. And then we have this beautiful hope of God himself coming down and being present among his people. Uh, if you see a description of that city, it says there's no need for the sun and moon because God, God's glory and the light of the Lamb will be sufficient uh, in the city. And there's no need for the temple because God's presence is there uh, in the city. And so this is the hope that uh, John gives to the believers to the churches of that day uh, who are facing immense persecution to say that if you remain strong, if you continue in faith, uh, this is the eternal hope that we have. Um, and it is an encouragement for us in the present as well that the eternal hope that we have is worth whatever happens on the earth, even if that means suffering, uh, because that glory and that sharing in the presence of God will be like nothing else we've ever experienced here on earth. So uh, the encouragement is don't turn away from the faith. Uh, don't give in to the pressures that are there in the culture around you, uh, the persecution that is coming against you. Don't lose hope in the face of persecution, but continue strong in the faith. Uh, with that, he closes, comes to the end of the book, giving them final uh, warnings and instructions and uh, closes uh, the book of Revelation with that. Uh, so we just have a few minutes, uh, actually just a minute. But if anyone would like to share anything or any thoughts or any questions, uh, we can address similar? those. Is it final judgment and white throne the similar? Uh, same in even? Yes, yes. So well, both the final judgment of uh, all those who have rejected God. Rejected God. Yes. Okay. okay. So we see there where they are sent into the lake of fire uh, is in that great white throne judgment. And uh, for the believers, when uh, they, do they face the judgment system? Uh, the judgment for believers happens during, so the rapture happens before the tribulation. And then okay. believers who come to faith during the tribulation also are raised uh, during the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, so that final judgment is for unbelievers. And for believers during the rapture and the tribulation period? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So we see uh, in the middle of the tribulation and at the end of the tribulation, uh, there are two times uh, when there are martyrs being mentioned who are in the presence of God. Uh, and then we see the millennial reign of Christ after the tribulation. Uh, this is where God reigns with his saints, right? Okay. So after that is when the judgment happens, after that millennial reign of Christ. Um, and the final judgment happens there. Okay, okay, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Anything else you would like to share?
Okay. Uh, so just to add, Sister Lucy, during the millennial reign, there will be believers. So though they will also uh, be judged. Uh, mm -hmm. But it will just be those believers who came to faith during Christ's millennial reign. Okay. During those uh, tribulations period and all. Uh, Post-tribulation, post when yeah. Satan is bound up and Christ reigns uh, mm -hmm. for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. uh, so during that time, there will be believers who are born, new believers who are born. Uh, mm -hmm. So all of those uh, people will still... Uh, be part of that final judgment. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Thank you, sister, for everything, all that you have taught us. We have Thank learned so much from you, sister. Oh, praise God. Thank you so much. So, thank you for uh, being with, staying with the class through this whole semester. Uh, I'll post the final quiz today and uh, so you all can just be on the lookout and um, just a reminder for interpreting scripture that today is the last day uh, for submitting your answers for the exam okay thank you have a good last few days of the semester thank you sister thank you so much